The year was 1990. Miss Saigon, the musical from the creative minds behind Les Miserables, was set to premiere on Broadway. But there was a hiccup. See, Miss Saigon had premiered at London's West End the year before to a seemingly great response. Both lead actors won an Olivier for their performances, which is London's equivalent of a Tony, I think. And the musical was a familiar story. By familiar, I mean Miss Saigon is to Madame a Butterfly what Rent is to La Boheme. A cool, new, fresh take on an older, operatic fave. So like, girl, what's the problem? It's a cool, new, fresh take, it's a good time, we love Madame a Butterfly, Puccini is bae, so we're gonna just turn around and it's the yellow face. But you, you've got to get the, the eyes up. <laughs> they don't go that way, Terry, they go this way. It's, it's the yellow face. Prosthetics. <laughs> Prosthetics. It's a, a light, sort of, uh, very light latex. I'd hate that. Does it not irritate and, and... I'd rather be without them, but it's, they're actually, uh, they're quite comfortable. And we, the great thing about them, you, um, no acting required once you've got those on. You just stand there and it uh, all happens. But it... See, producer Cameron McIntosh made the mistake of thinking the prosthetics and yellow face they put on Jonathan Price in the London West End production would... Wait a minute. Oh my god, is that the High Sparrow? High Sparrow, is that you? High Sparrow? I'm sorry. Y'all have already told me to stop doing these accents, so I, I'm sorry. The plan was to bring Price to America to reprise his role as the engineer. But Asian Americans were not having it, girl. Actor B.D. Wong and playwright David Henry Huang wrote public letters protesting Price's performance. That's quite the alliteration, Khadija. And actually brought this issue to Equity, which is one of the state's leading unions, I guess you'd call it. It's a union in the state's fourth theater. As you can imagine, after that, things got kind of hairy. Macintosh threatened to cancel the show. Producer Cameron Macintosh, who's abroad at the moment, has just said he won't take Miss Saigon to New York without its British non-Asian star. But, you know, this is a numbers game. This was employing a lot of people. Broadway couldn't afford to lose that kind of money. Plus, you had British equity talking about how hypocritical American equity was being. We can understand their desire to help their Asian members. Actors have a rotten time, all actors everywhere, and particularly here and in America. Minority groups of actors have a worse time than ordinary actors, obviously. What we object to, and object to quite strongly, is that they aren't applying those policies to their own members. They're using the coincidence of, of Jonathan Price and Miss Saigon going to Broadway to apply their new policies, try them out on him, and, and, and that we, we consider to be offensive, frankly. Besides, this wasn't a fight about representation. This was about freedom of speech, even though he's British. This was about artistic expression. This was about the best person for the role getting the job. Hello and welcome slash welcome back to my channel. My name is Khadija, your favorite internet play auntie. Hello to all my returning nieces, nephews, and nibblings, and my fellow aunties, uncles, and pibblings. If you're new, feel free to take a look around, suss out the vibe. I just sit on my floor, talk about whatever I want. Sometimes I do video essays, sometimes I talk with my friends, and sometimes I do commentary. I did that out of order, but you know. Today's gonna be a video essay on colorblind casting versus identity conscious casting. I'll explain why I've changed the term of that. We're gonna talk about a couple of examples within that, AKA Hamilton and Malcolm and Marie, and yeah, just get into it. But before we do that, I want to address some things. Firstly, in my Bridgerton video, I said Latinx, and there were quite a few people that were like, don't say that. And <laughs> I, uh, I want to apologize if I offended anyone. That's a shitty apology. We're gonna, don't you hate when people say that? I'm sorry if I offended you. No, clearly I did. So I want to apologize for that. I could have just said Latina, Latino, and Latinx. Ironically enough, in my attempt to be inclusionary, I was not being inclusionary. So I do apologize for that and I'm gonna correct it from here on out. The other thing is I used a clip from a video from Costuming Drama's channel and I had credited Erica, who was the person that was speaking, the Asian woman that was speaking, but 
I didn't link her Instagram below and I, I had put the video in the description, but I feel like I could have done a way better job of actually putting their video into it. So uh, I'm gonna link the video again here because that video is what inspired me to do the Bridgerton talk. And I didn't even realize that the Bridgerton video would blow up the way it did. So I really just wanna give credit where credit is due. They reached out to me and I just was like, oh my gosh, and they were so gracious and so nice. And were just like, hey girl, just, you know, hey. And I was like, oh my God, ah. So please, 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 I'm gonna link their video below and I'll link Erica's Instagram as well. I think all of the, people that were on that discussion are costume designers. One of y'all can comment and let me know if I'm incorrect, but the channel itself is called Costuming Drama. So yeah, all of that will be linked below. Please go check them out. Check out their Bridgerton video because it was a really great conversation and go give them some love. Just wanted to say that. And with all that out of the way, let's get to the video. So I want you to do an experiment with me. Close your eyes and just picture the body of a regular person just any person, just close your eyes and picture it. What does this person look like? Are they skinny? Are they fat? Are they able-bodied? Are they wearing a hijab? What gender are they? What race? Okay, you can open your eyes now. The reason that I wanted you to do that experiment is because I wanted to see what your personal default body looked like in your mind's eye. I should probably explain what a default body is. In her 2018 book, The Body Is Not An Apology, Writer Sonia Renee Taylor defines the default body as the bodies that we picture when we close our eyes. For some of us, we may have pictured someone reminiscent of a Lizzo or an Alec, or maybe even a Melissa Blake. But for most of us, those weren't the people that we were picturing. But don't worry, it's not your fault. Whatever default body you had in your mind's eye says more about the media that you consume and the world around you, your smaller world, let's say. Because as Sonia Renee Taylor puts it, we live in a world that's afraid to acknowledge difference. For a long time, we've equated difference with something that's dangerous or for some, something that's undesirable. But Sonia points out that difference is not the problem. It's our approach to difference that's the issue. Now, this video is about identity conscious casting and why it could be a better alternative for our entertainment industry going forward. So why am I talking about different bodies? Because identity conscious casting is about acknowledging difference, different bodies and different experiences. Yes, when you're telling a story, you wanna to touch on common human themes, you know, love and pain, joy and sorrow. But when you're talking about different people, the nuances of those differences, that's what changes in the storytelling. That's what's gonna look different and that's okay. So with all that being said, let's explore why we need to do away with the idea that we can see everybody the same and lean into different bodies. Let's see what collaborative efforts can be gained from that nuanced approach in storytelling. Mother. We're only talking maybe four or 500 at the most. Mother, you can't keep doing this to me. What? Max, what's he saying? He's saying he doesn't want to have another ball. No, he's not. Mm. Here we go. <gasps> so according to Actors' Equity, colorblind casting is defined as the casting of ethnic and female artists in roles in which race, ethnicity, or gender is not germane, relevant, to the characters or the play's development. Now, Wikipedia has quite the extensive list of examples of colorblind casting, but as far as I know, it wasn't a named concept until the 1980s. I should mention that Actors' Equity seems to prefer calling it non-traditional casting, but I'm gonna use those terms interchangeably. So how did we get here? Well, in 1986, Actors' Equity completed a survey that showed that over the four years they evaluated, 90% of all of the theater productions in the US were with an all-white cast. Hold up! So after this finding, they held a two-day symposium called the National Symposium on Non-Traditional Casting. It was produced by Equity and co-produced by the Non-Traditional Casting Project, which changed their name in 2007 to the Alliance for Inclusion in the Arts. So depending on which source you read, they had two different numbers, but there were anywhere from 500 to 1,000 actors, directors, casting directors, educators, critics, all who attended this symposium. At this symposium, 18 scenes of non-traditional casting were presented 
with guidelines from the non-traditional casting project or the alliance for, you know, you know. Those guidelines were societal, cross-cultural, conceptual, and blind. So this was a seemingly good first step with addressing the issue of discrimination, specifically within the theater world with regard to race, but nothing is without fault. There was actually a complaint brought up that the 1986 symposium didn't do anything to address issues of actors with disabilities. So when they held the second symposium in 1990, the second day was dedicated to addressing these issues. Actors recounted their stories of being a blind actor and being told at an audition that they weren't blind enough or didn't look blind enough. Other actors talked about how they wouldn't even be called by agents for non-speaking roles. One actor was talking about how they had a lot of success in their career until they had an accident. They were put in a wheelchair and after that they weren't hired for anything. And she was like, you know, my talent is the same. My face is the same. People just don't want to deal with the burden of hiring me. They would rather put someone who's able-bodied in a wheelchair than have to actually deal with me who's actually in a wheelchair. It was, mm, mm. People were also speaking up about the lack of indigenous representation at the 1990 conference. Donna Coteau Brooks of the SAC and Fox Nation was quoted as saying this, rarely does a native American Indian woman get to play the roles written for her. And since she is not hired to play other roles, she's mostly unemployed. So we have this major acting union realizing that there is an issue with discrimination. They've named the problem, they're making steps to address it. So, in the 80s and 90s, colorblind casting becomes the new wave. And this really speaks to the way we were thinking at that time. In the 80s and 90s, and even for much of the 2000s, people really believed in being colorblind, not just in the entertainment industry, but in everyday life. If I don't see race, then I can't be racist. Or if I see you as being the same as me, then I can't be discriminating against you. In the entertainment industry, colorblind casting or non-traditional casting was used as a way to say, look, if it isn't pertinent to the role, anyone in any body can play it. I can look back at that time and have a bit of compassion for understanding because they were just taking steps at the beginning, for sure. But the road to hell is paved with good intentions and colorblind non-traditional casting has more limits than benefits, I think. As of 2016, colorblind casting was the most popular form of casting, and it is in the equity guidelines that you are supposed to use this method. In the 2015-2016 year, 68% of Broadway actors were white, 32% were people of color, but only 9.6% of people of color were casted in roles where race wasn't relevant to the role. I'm going to link the Hollywood Diversity Report below a video and their actual document because it's a great way to track where Hollywood is lagging when it comes to representation and where they're actually, you know, picking up the pace. The only gripe I guess I have with it is that they basically say women and minorities instead and, and that to me is always a problem because people do it all the time, basically erasing women of color from the conversation, it's a whole thing. so. Going back a bit to why I think colorblind casting is so popular besides it being an equity guideline and it just, you know, people have a hard time doing new things. Audiences play a really big factor in how people will cast something. The entertainment industry is a numbers game and in the US it's worth over $600 billion. So in some people's eyes, who you cast determines who comes to watch, determines how many people, determines how much money. And even though, according to the Hollywood Diversity Report, quote, minorities accounted for the majority of ticket sales for five of the top 10 films in 2016, there's still a discussion around whether white audiences will go to see something if the cast doesn't have any white people in it, or if the roles relegated to white people are very small. All right, where am I? Don't scare me like that, colonizer. And the answer to that question, I think, is yes. Kind of. Alexander Hamilton was a dreamer. George Washington, Eliza Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson were dreamers. Hamilton, an American musical, embodies the best values, the best impulses that make our nation a beacon to the world. Look around. Look around. 
how lucky we are to be alive right now. Thank you. So Hamilton premiered on Broadway in 2015 and we all know what happened after that. It was everywhere and received everything. Universal critical acclaim, awards and nominations were coming out the wazoo, they got a Kennedy honors. Did they get a Pulitzer? <laughs> but when we think about the casting in Hamilton, it's interesting. The choice to cast black and brown people in the roles of these historically white figures was seen by some as a way to bring people of color back into the narrative, a way to show our contributions to the building of America, and a way to show the importance of immigrants to this land. Immigrants. 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 Honestly, when I first saw Hamilton, there was something electrifying about seeing this history that I'd always been taught shown in this way with these black and brown bodies and, and just the music with references that I understood. I mean, y'all, satisfied? <laughs> I'm sorry. A whole set of actors rewinding on a stage on a giant turntable? It's magnifique. But as I said, you can like something and still be critical of it. Years later, it premiered on Disney Plus for everyone to give Big Disney their coins and get a bit of the magic. And because it got a wider audience, because we were all stuck at home, because we again had decided Black Lives Matter, and because we were in our fourth year of you know who's administration, how do I put this? The shit just hit different, you know what I'm saying? There's something to be said about Lin-Manuel Miranda's genius in this show, the ideal of putting black and brown bodies at the center of this. But I have to wonder, does the message mean the same thing if the actors are black and brown, but the characters are all white? There's no evidence that the casting of this project was used through a colorblind lens. I mean, in 2013, Lin-Manuel said this, It's a thorny issue, but I think that race and gender should be considered the same way that height and age are. They're a factor. I think even if they didn't intend on using colorblind casting, the DNA, the, the foundational structure of what that term means, is how Hamilton is cast. And I say that because most of the characters are playing are white, but the actors are not, with the exception of a couple. Technically, it's all artistic expression. I mean, what's the difference between Jonathan Price, a white man playing a fictional Asian character, and a black actor playing a real life white person? When you're talking about artistic expression, it can get kind of murky. And before you start typing, I know that there is a power dynamic at play here, okay? I know that Jonathan Price was taking roles away from Asian American actors, which is even worse because there's already so much underrepresentation there. So yes, I get it. Whereas with Hamilton, as we said before, only 9.6% of roles by people of color were played where, role, where race wasn't important. So Hamilton was instead giving roles to people of color and giving more representation. I know, I know, but you know, I like to think about things from many angles. So we come back to the question that I asked before. Do white people want to see a show where there aren't white people or whiteness isn't centered and slash or the white characters have very minimal roles? And I still think the answer is yes, kind of. As I said, even though it's mostly black and brown people on stage performing traditionally black and brown music, they're still playing white characters that are not fictional. They're the founding fathers. Telling this story through a black and brown lens kind of gives the founding fathers a sort of cool cachet. And instead of bringing black and brown people into the history, it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of giving me a, people aren't interested in our histories or our stories black and brown people, unless whiteness is involved somehow. 
2015 was obviously a different time than now. Looking back on it with a 2021 lens, I have to look at the casting and kind of wonder if they're saying it's technically not colorblind, even though I see that it is in a way, and if they're saying that it's leaning more towards color conscious, then how conscious is it? I was writing in my journal one day and had an epiphanous moment and was like, oh, I'm awkward, period, and black. And I had never seen those two words together before, and I felt like they perfectly described me and described characters I wanted to see on television. Because, you know, I related to Tina Fey and uh, Larry David and all these, you know, quirky white, white characters that shared a sense of humor that I felt like I had, but didn't see people so of color get to. So it is autobiographical. Uh, no, nah, I wouldn't say it was autobiographical. I would say that it's close to my life, for sure. So in my Bridgerton video, I called this term color conscious casting because that was the most inclusive term that I knew at that time. I've since discovered in doing research for this video, the term identity conscious casting. So that's what I'll be using from now on. I can't say who exactly invented this term, but I will credit this new realizing to Chicago director, Lavina Jadwani. We'll talk about her more in a second. First, I'm gonna give you some definitions. So if color conscious casting is taking into consideration a person's race and skin color, then identity conscious casting is taking in all of those things, plus body shape, gender identity, gender expression, national origin, you name it, all intersections of a person's identity. Now, as I mentioned before, Lavina Jadwani is a Chicago-based director, adapter, and advocate. She's also a self-proclaimed professional Shakespeare nerd, which I just really loved. In a conversation between Lavina Jadwani and Victor Vasquez, the founder and casting director of X Casting NYC, they talked about identity conscious casting when it comes to adapting canonical works, which is a lot of the work that Jadwani does and about considering identity conscious casting or identity consciousness when adapting new works, or sorry, creating new works. I'm gonna link this below so y'all should really read it because I just found this conversation so enlightening and it's what happens when you have people that are advocates also being in the arts. And they talked about the idea of having casting directors be casting designers. Because in Vasquez's eyes, it should be just as important for a casting director to come into a project earlier on, instead of having to fit X person into X box, they come in and they're part of the creative process. This type of casting and just the way Jedwani and Vasquez were talking about, it just seemed like everything was way more of a collective and collaborative effort. Instead of just designating each person to each role, you have people being able to work together and make sure that the project is fully realized with each other. Jedwani states that when she's thinking about a work, she pictures all of the characters as people of color. And to that, Vasquez responded, the power of imagination is exactly what casting is. I think the American theater struggles to understand this work. Casting as imagination. Casting as a culture-making machine. I believe that wholeheartedly because when you're in charge of casting something, you're not only in charge of making sure that the vision comes to real life, but what everyone sees, how everyone interprets it, and then, oddly enough, how people feel about themselves. In Sonia Renee Taylor's book, she says, when we don't see ourselves reflected in the world around us, we make judgments about that absence. So casting is culture making. Now, Lavina Jadwani's mentor, Bill Rausch, said something that I think we should consider when we're talking about representation and the lack of it, which is that we can't tell everyone's story at once. And the reason that I wanted to bring that in is because I may have been a bit harsh on Bridgerton in terms of the lack of representation for everyone because some people just simply were not gonna get represented, unfortunately. I still stand by, you know, the colorism, 1000%. I stand by both the video, but I just thought I should say that. Maybe I wasn't too harsh on them, but I just, that, you know, we're learning and growing. I do think though that when you have more clarity of vision in the type of story that you're trying to tell and, you know, you just stay open to the process and open to the different identities that you're interacting with and the collaborative effort that can come from that. I don't know, I think the sky's the limit and I think you can get it really right. 
I think a recent film that provides an interesting sort of observation of this identity conscious casting and just this collaborative effort is Malcolm and Marie. Tell me where the pills are. Um. Mm. And that Malcolm is what authenticity buys you. So spoilers, I guess, if you haven't seen it, but Malcolm and Marie is a Netflix movie that came out in 2021. By the time you see this, I think it will have been last week or the week before. And it's been receiving, at least at time of filming this, a lot of mixed reviews. I personally actually like the film. Did I enjoy watching straight people toxically fight at each other for an hour and 46 minutes? Debatable. Did Zendaya act her ass off? Uh, yeah, 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 she did, yeah, she did. She yeah, wow, damn. So the reason though that I bring this film up in the context of identity conscious casting is because the director and creator is a white man. I'm Sam Levinson, I'm the writer-director of Malcolm and Marie. So for those of you that don't know, he also is a creator of Euphoria, and him and Zendaya have a really great working relationship, at least it seems that way since they've been working together a few times now. I read a couple of articles where, oddly enough, they were written by white people, talking about some issues behind, or just at least bringing up why some people might be concerned that this white director wrote this script and directed these two black characters. And the articles are mostly just citing black people on Twitter, but I found that point interesting because from what I've been reading about this process, it seems very much in the vein of the identity conscious collaborative effort that I was mentioning before. The reason that I say that is because Lavina Jadwani does a lot of adapting of plays. When you look at photos on her website and things like that, you see that her cast is very eclectic and she is a Southeast Asian woman. She's not black, she's not white, you know. And so she is directing different people of color in these roles. She's not necessarily trying to speak for what black people are gonna think about this or whoever. And I guess it's a bit different because she's adapting the work. The vibe that I get from her is that there is room, and I'm gonna say collaboration so much in here, but that there is a lot of room for collaboration when she was going through the process of questions to ask when you're doing identity conscious casting, that will be linked below. It was very cool to read about how they would figure out the different working relationships of is this, if this character is black and this, period, this show is set in this period of time, what kind of dynamics are there at play here? What does this say? Are we feeding into to typical tropes? Do we want to be doing that? Okay, let's picture this, let's picture this. And it's very much a very like spider webby thinking about it from as many angles as possible. And it's a bit of a process, but the end result, the audience sees the details of that. With Malcolm and Marie, Zendaya and John David were producers on the show, on the show, on the film. Levinson talked about how if there was something weird in the script or something was off, you know, he came to them and they could say, hey, this isn't really working, I don't appreciate this, or no, this is totally cool. And you can kind of see that he cares about that collaborative effort because in Euphoria's most recent episode, the one focused on Jules, Hunter Schaefer was the co-writer of that episode, allowing the actor to kind of, you know, tell their own narrative through their identity and it might not be exactly the same as the characters but they're bringing their identity and their experience into the role into the writing process into into all of it and going back to the conversation between victor vasquez and lavina jadwani he talks about how sometimes when he's auditioning people he'll just ask them things about their lives because a lot of the times even when someone's going through something in their life that relates to the character, that's that's a different perspective and approach that they can bring to the role that you wouldn't know if you don't ask those questions. 
I get a lot of people that will message me asking about what they think about white people writing characters of color. And I want to first say that I do really want to stress the importance of representation behind the scenes. I know when I talk about representation, some people might think it just means on camera, but it's just as important behind the scenes. It's, it, it, it really just, it shows. It really just shows. With that being said, I don't think that it is impossible for someone of one race to write stories where they have a diverse cast of different people because you're not going to be able to have the experience of every race in that room. I think that the way to approach it is through, at least for me, is through an identity conscious lens of thinking, okay, I'm going to write these characters. I sort of have an idea in mind of what their person, I know what their personalities are, all of this sort of stuff, but I don't necessarily know who exactly will play them. So at first it might seem colorblind, right? But then people come in, they have the essence of the character. When Jadwani was talking about their process, they just wrote on a board who, no matter what gender, what age, what anything, who is the essence of this character? What famous person? And then they kind of went from there. So, you know, you start writing, you have the essence of the person and then, and honestly, any writers, please comment below and tell me what the process is. I was talking with my sister about it more because she's in film school, so she has a bit more of a lens into this. I'm in like the opera theater-y type stuff, but I just think that at least having, you know, your character traits and all this stuff in mind and then allowing the actor that comes into the role a sort of agency to helping guide that process. Maybe it's easier for theater than it is for film. I totally can't say because I don't have as much, I don't have experience with film. I'm on the other side of that. But I think at least being able to have that, again, collaborative effort, it shows, it allows for, to me, more nuance in the character writing. So if you're a person and you are worried about not being the race of the characters that you want to add in there just really do some deep investigating for yourself and then also do some investigating with the people that you hire to be in the roles and get their feedback because i think it's just as important i think as a performer a lot of times we think we're just relegated to just standing there shut up and sing shut up and act don't have any input but there's input to be had there i wanted to give a segue into final thoughts but like y'all you'll take what i give you okay it is that practice of the production of meaning, the practice of what are called signifying practices, practices that are involved in the production of meaning that media studies uh, is concentrated on, concentrated on the effects and the products of signifying practices. Okay, I did not expect for this to be a video essay, but to my surprise, there <laughs> a lot of people are writing about color conscious casting and colorblind casting. What? As I said before, I was talking to my little sister about this and she's on the film school side of things. And so she was like, I definitely think it's interesting. I don't know how realistic it is. And, you know, we were also just talking about how when you look at demographics, let's say of the United States, if I really look at them and I'm being honest with myself, the most underrepresented group, and my sister was putting this out to me, is Latinos, Latinas, Latinx people. Like that's, that's... If we're looking at the numbers of like per population, what's happening here. So I think it's it's just pretty interesting. I'll link stuff below so y'all can check out the numbers for yourselves and kind of see. I, it was it was just interesting to look at comparing like the population of New York to equity members and the discrepancies there. I was kind of like, mm, there, are, there are more white people as equity members demographically than there are for New York City percentage wise. But anyway, look at look at the numbers and check them out. I don't have a firm, like everything, I don't have a firm stance on this. I'm just reading some shit off the internet, bringing it to y'all, seeing what you think, and just talking about it. I am a firm believer that anybody trying to tell you they have a distinct firm answer is selling you snake oil. Um, that was a weird stance to take on this video. <laughs> I just mean that like, it might seem like a cop out, but to me, I don't know, when I'm doing research on this stuff, I just end up having more questions than answers. What does a world look like where we consider identity conscious casting more than anything? Because as I've mentioned briefly, you know, I've just been thinking a lot about new womanhood. What does it even mean to be a woman? And if I go into a casting, I'm femme, yes. But would I say necessarily that I agree with the title of woman and how that character is written? 
So then how does that work? How would I speak to a casting agent or a director? How would we collaborate whoever wrote the script? How would we figure out what we're going to do to bring this character to life? And, and, you know, I don't know. I don't know. That That's a weird way to put it. But do y'all know what I mean? There's just so many ways to think about this. I totally get being an artist and having a vision and being like, I want this person to look this way and this way because it's imperative to the story and blah, 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 blah. I understand that. But I also just think this is a cool way. I, I just have been very much in terms of uh, learning about producing my own stuff and, and learning the ins and outs slowly but surely about creating my own works. I just have been very about the collaborative process and knowing probably because I am a singer knowing that I don't have the answers and I can't be in charge of everything so I want to get as much feedback and as much as much just like fun as I can with it one of our mentors for one of the programs that I'm in was talking about how he's working with this opera this opera company in Canada and it's just a room full of indigenous artists and creators and so the working process has been so completely different for him than it has been in most of the other spaces that he's worked in and he was like it's just changed the way that I want to do work from now on we come in we all sit in a circle we talk about how we're doing and then everything is just collaborative instead of just being like your job is here your job is here go here go here ne'er the two shall meet I'm not saying that film and television and and theater and all of this stuff don't collaborate I don't mean that but I just think there can be more input and two brains are better than one. I always go back to that Queen's Gambit episode when she finally realizes, oh, the reason that you know the Russian players are so good is because they work together. They don't just have one person thinking about something, they collaborate and come up with a solution. And so, yeah, I just think this would be a really cool and beautiful way to do casting. I think it's really interesting and I don't know, that's, that's it, that's all you get. I'm going into vocal fry because I've been talking too much. All right, feed your pets, water your plants. Why do I sound like James Franco in the deuce? Feed your pets, water, it's a 70s look. Okay, Khadija, feed your pets, water your plants, and remember that you can always like change your mind because you like can, okay like? Okay, I will catch y'all in the next one. Bye. Let the music play. I just wanna dance the night away. Yeah, right here, right here's where I'm gonna stay all night long. Ooh, ooh, I'm like Barry White. Okay, I can't tell if this is 70s or if this is like mid 90s. Ooh, ah, suck it to me like you want to. Ooh, I could take it like a pro, you know. <laughs> These are the outtakes. Let's see who makes it to the end of the outtakes. Oh, if you make it to the end of the outtakes, that means you could drop a little uh, cartwheel emoji. Is that cool? Cartwheel. Yeah. It's a secret one. Don't tell everybody. Only the, only the real ones get to see it. You know. Okay, this is going to be a really long outro. I'm sorry. Bye.